Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for coming to this session. I assume I'm probably on the one who's holding you from ending the day. Anybody has a session after? Perfect. So, my name is Ariel. Uh, I work today in Cisco, in the Emerging Technology Innovation Team. Uh, I was part of uh, Portshift. Portshift was a startup acquired by Cisco. Uh, we're developing cloud-native security tools for Kubernetes, for Istio, um, and now we're doing it in Cisco. Uh, before that, I was the head of the serverless security in Aqua, and even before that, I worked in Checkpoint, uh, working in some open source contributions, um, contributor and maintainer in Cube Clarity. Uh, we try to encourage everyone to test and use something which is very useful uh, for whoever, whoever is using Kubernetes in production. It's you know handling all types of you know software issues from vulnerabilities to uh, uh, signing S bomb and and everything. So you can check and validate it uh, in your clusters. It's a very interesting approach at giving you like an accurate snapshot. Never mind that the, the topic of this talk. Also working in the CNCF in different top projects and some contributes to the Mitre Tech metrics for containers. Now, before I start, uh, just a quick poll. Okay, we're not a lot of people. How many of you here in the audience, you know, handle deployment of containers on a daily basis? You can raise your hand. Perfect. Thank you. How many of you are, you know, hardening the settings of the containers which you deploy? Okay, part, a smaller part. Have you heard or used prod security profiles? Yes, okay, perfect, great. So you're in the right place. Um, so a little bit about, you know, the basics of pod security. So we all know what pods are. Each pod has a security context that control the runtime settings of the pod. Now those settings are very powerful. They, you know, we all, we all, you know, scan our code for vulnerabilities and we really get worried even if we have like a medium or a high vulnerability that's completely irrelevant to the code that we write. But a lot of times we don't really look at the security settings. Security settings are, de you know, defining what privileges the, the pod has, uh, what capabilities it extracts from the operating system, you know, what volumes it can mount, what access it can have to the file system of the host. So these are really powerful settings. Now the defaults are very permissive, okay? But if you can, but they can be modified, they can harden, and hardening them can really eliminate, you know, a lot of security pitfalls. It can really eliminate the need to use external tools or governance. Just by using it correctly, you can improve significantly the level of your clusters. Now, PSP or Pod Security Profiles, so where we're designed to control those the security context of these pods. And the topic of this talk is to talk about a little bit about it, what it is, why they are deprecated, what, they are, what can be done instead of it, and how we can really enhance and automate uh, the entire thing. So another little bit look of how the PSP structure uh, was supposed to be is something which I took from the AWS EKS uh, environment. So pod security starts with a policy. Uh, as you can see in the policy, you can define the spec. You can see this is like an example of a very permissive spec. You can see the containers can run as privilege and it allow privilege escalation. It can use any capabilities from the operating system. It can, use, it can mount any volume. Um, and even if you look all the way down to the bottom, um, it can, it doesn't, you know, doesn't allow, I mean, it can do right, it has right access to the uh, file system of the host. Now, in order to apply those policies, you need to take one extra step and you need to create a role, okay? Uh, and in this role, you need to, you know, uh, define the policies and use, the, and, and, and use them and then create a role binding and then you are set and you're, and you're, and you're ready to go with the PSP. So, PSP was a great initiative uh, if you want to take, take a look at an example, so this is an example of the MitreTech uh, Mitre framework for containers. So every cell here represents a real attack which was detected in the wild, meaning it's a real attack that happened and can be uh, identified. 
uh, and by you know s using using the security context or hardening configured you know correctly, you can eliminate you know 30, 40 percent of those attacks just by you know doing simple hardening, uh, simple automation. You can really bring you know reduce dramatically the attack surface of your cluster. So the potential is great. The impact is big. It's really useful. And then one of the questions that you want to ask yourself if this is really true, then why PSP is deprecated, okay? Why we know that it's in Kubernetes 1.21, 1.21, they started deprecation, probably completely over by, uh, completely removed from the code in 1.25, and the question is why, if it's such a huge benefit. And, and I think this is a classical case of great intent, but I would say a challenging implementation. You know, when you really use PSP, and I don't know if many of you has if you had a good positive experience or not, um, it creates some challenges. So, for example, if you're adding a PSP while the cluster is active, it's already running, and you want to add PSP, you can result, you know, without you know paying attention to the policies, you can mistakenly like you know deny all pods entry, and you're going to stop like you know, deploying any pods uh, in your cluster. There is no auditing. So if there is a failure because of the PSP, you don't know that you know that there is a failure, but you don't know why. What caused this failure? Which of course makes it much harder to debug. Uh, when you create a PSP policy and you think, okay, great, I'm done, but you didn't update the authorization, the role, you know, the role, the role, you know, the the role-based access control, uh, then you didn't do anything. So I think you know it's really great intent. You know, it was really uh, a good thing to do, but the implementation. Uh, was a bit challenging. So yes, very sorry, PSP is deprecated. But no worries, uh, there is something uh, instead. So instead of PSP, um, there is a new security model. Uh, it uses similar concept, but slightly different implementation. So the new model simplified the governance of uh, the security context. It creates three default pod security standards that enable three you know, different levels of pod deployment. We'll touch in a minute what each level provide. But I think the most important thing is that users can customize them. Those are just recommendations. You can, of course, go ahead and customize it and create something which really you know, tune to what you need, what you think is needed, what you think is important. Um, the enforcement is much simpler. Instead of using uh, role-based access control, using admission controller. Uh, and this gives you, as I'll show you, really high level of flexibility and really a very good level of uh, you know enhancements and you know it follows the basic kubernetes policies model that you define the more the policies are decoupled from enforcement you define policies in one place you enforce them with other things and this is a great uh, way forward so yeah <laughs> we have enhancements perfect um, let's a little bit talk a little bit about you know the standards so the standards are accumulative Privilege, those are the default, right? You can, of course, as I said, create your own and customize it, something that fits your needs. But the privilege is all the default settings. Everything is allowed to go ahead, break everything, do whatever you want. Uh, let's party. Uh, the second one is baseline, which is minimal restrictions, pretty much. Don't run as privilege, don't run as a root, no privilege escalation. And the upper one is restricted, which is like implementing the security best practices. Oh, sorry. So starting by Kubernetes version 1.22, we're having those three standards which define you know, the, security, the secure settings of pod deployments. And those policies are cumulative, and they start from very highly permissive into highly restrictive. Now, um, again, if you ask me, even when you do some things in Kubernetes, you still need some marketing. Because calling restricted to the pol to the to the policy which really provides you the security best practices is probably not the right way to do. If you would ask my recommendation, I would say use by default the restricted environment. I don't think it's heavily restricted. It pretty much give you it follow all the security best practices of you know what capabilities you want the pod to inherit from the operating system, what volumes you can mount. It doesn't let you write as privilege, not running as a root, and not not allow you to escalate privileges which I don't think is a bad thing. It recommends you know, read-only read -only writes the host file system. So in general, my recommendation is you know, use the restricted uh, profile. And then if you have exceptions, use the exceptions. 
again, I think no one, nobody wants to be restricted, so I think probably would you could use a better name for that. But never mind, that's what it is. I think it's a, definitely a, a good or recommended uh, you know, pro, uh, profile to use. Okay, next, let's talk about admission controllers. How many people have experience with admission controllers? Great. Okay, so what is admission controller? Just like, you know, in a very short and brief way, any API request in Kubernetes to the API server has certain stages. It passes before it reached the API, it reached the API server and being executed, right? So like, you know, things like, you know, authentication and schema validation, I mean, sure, I can, I can do it. Those are important steps. But I think another very important critical step is to use the admission control. The admission controller allow you to, using a webhook, and allow you to really pretty much validate or modify uh, the request based on predefined policies or predefined ones. So for example, you can create a validation webhook that, pr that any you know, pod that is asked to be deployed, if it, for example, have critical vulnerabilities, you know, it will not be able to, you will not be able to deploy it because every time that, you know, we want to execute uh, a build uh, command, we will check the validation webhook, can check and see if it meets the certain policies. So using admission control is a great way. Using it for security can really provide you an agentless approach. You don't need to deploy agents, you don't deploy sidekick -like containers. You can really use admission controller uh, and govern your entire state of your cluster. Great. Now, two quick things. Um, validate, you know, admission controller has two modes. It has the mutating webhook, okay, which allow you to really mutate and fix, update, change, modify the request. And it has the validating webhook that you can just check if it yes, no, if it meets or doesn't meet, you know, the need. You can use both. You can use just one, okay. But the idea that if there is an API request that doesn't reject it by any of those controllers then the entire request is rejected and is not moved to the API server and consequently is not being uh, executed in your clusters. It's great. Now, if you do want to use admission controllers, you can create your own, you can create your own customized resource, but you can use what the CNCF uh, provides. So there are two projects uh, in CNCF. One is the Open Policy Agent, one is Kiverno. Each one of them has an admission controller uh, that you can use for your purposes. So the open policy agent, um, those who are not familiar, so it's just you know small introduction. Um, it's lightweight, uh, general purpose policy engine. You can write policies using declarative language or regu, okay? Um, and then you can use the gatekeeper as an admission controller uh, to enforce those policies. So it's a mature project. Uh, it's graduated, four years, tons of stars. Uh, it can be used. And you can see here an example of a policy in Regu that eliminate or prevent containers from running as privileged. Of course, you can take it, you know, one level deeper and say, okay, instead of running as privileged, just use one of those, you know, uh, standards, either the default or the one which I customize. Okay, so it's a great way to make, you know, enforcement to the security state that you want. Uh, Kiverno is more interesting, uh, I'm not saying more interesting, I would maybe be caveat, it's another alternative uh, to use uh, declarative policies. Here the policies are not written in Regu, it's more like a CRDs. So, you know, it could be like, you know, uh, very simple whoever write CRDs uh, to relay to those policies. And here in Kiverno you also have an admission controller that can mutate and validate uh, requests. It's a slightly younger project, it's still in standbox. 2.5 thousand stars, it's a good start. Okay, great. So we talked about the new model. We know what, sta what the security standards are, admission, what admission controller is, what admission controller options we have. Let's take a deep look in implementation. So when we really want to, saying the Moon is, is a great initiative, okay, definitely you know, accelerate adoption of security hardening, but there are a few items that you know, would love to hear what you think about, I think can be slightly enhanced if you really want to reach uh, the good level of security. One thing is that the current model is uh, restricted to namespace level implementation. So you implement a security standard on a full namespace, okay? Um, and 
the same security standard applied to the entire namespace. Ideally, you probably would want to have some granularity level, right? You would like to apply maybe different standards to different pods, so you can have like each service or based on the service risk, apply or use different uh, standards. So this is, you know, one option. Um, another thing which, in my opinion, can be slightly challenged is the fact that it only uses the validating webhook. So we have a binary decision, either yes or no, is it good or is it bad? If it's good, fine, we can move ahead. If it's bad, we reject it and we go back to give the users go back and go and fix the failure. And here, one of the things I thought can make it slightly more interesting is two small enhancements. So for example, um, we can use a hybrid mode of admission controllers. Right, so if you think just the validating webhook, we need to remember that admission controller also has the mutating webhook. And if we use both options, for example, instead of just making this decision which is yes, no, is it okay, is it bad, we can also add the option of fix it. So for example, let's assume that you want to apply a certain standard as a basic. Okay, saying this is, let's say, the basic security setting, we want all the pods to run in our cluster. Now, if you're using the mutating webhook, if by mistake someone, you know, make a deployment, you know, without remembering what you think is the best security method to use, or just because you use a Helm chart or use something that you found uh, intended or just downloaded from any repository, then your mutating webhook can not just tell you, okay, sorry, you failed, but can fix it for him because this is what you think should be done, right? So the mutating webhook give us the capabilities, not just giving you a yes, no question, are you compliant or not, but also modifying it and changing it based on what you think should be the right result. So this is, I think, in my opinion, uh, an, a good enhancement uh, to the current model. You know, we'd love to hear what you think about it. We think it's useful. Um, another thing that can help us to do more customization or more granularity in the usage of the standards is using something like a pod ID. Something like if you're familiar with Spiffy uh, or if you're familiar with Kubernetes labels, okay? And then when you create, uh, you know, a policy to enforce a standard, don't enforce it on a namespace, but only enforce it on your selected approach. So this way, if you have a service which is more sensitive, you can apply to him a more, you know, restricted uh, security standards. If you have something which is, you know, less sensitive, less important, more closely coupled, you can enforce a more flexible, a more permissive uh, security standard. So having those capabilities, this granularity allow you to get, you know, better fine-tuned policies and again, uh, achieve your results of being secure without restricting thing that doesn't have to be restricted. So those are, I think, two enhancements uh, that we can, uh, you know, enhance uh, the current model. I want to have just, you know, one word uh, about automation. So we all love automate and we really want to automate and then you ask yourself, okay, but how does what you show here with the granularity and everything can do with automation? So here just sharing something, you know, from our user experience um, and again, uh, would love to hear what you think about it, um, is a lot of times, you know, we want developers to own their respon the security responsibility of their service, right? You create a new service, you know the best, what will be the best way, or what will be the best settings for it, how you want it to run, you know, what privileges you need, what capabilities uh, are required. And here, you know, using GitOps, in this case, you know, we use the Argo CD, but doesn't necessarily have to be Argo, you can use it, you know, with, uh, you know, with any GitOps tool, then you can ask your developers when they committing a code, right, committing a code which will then go to deployment also to create uh, the security settings or to create the policy that this service should run with. And then, okay, uh, when you create this rule, okay, that define what will be the desired a profile that would be, you know, for this service, you can upload it to the Git. Now, when using GitOps, right, the policy rules will be automatically added 
to your admission to your engine or to your policy engine which runs in the cluster when you sync your you know your git so when the argo cd for example sync your git repo it will not just put the up, push the update of the new code but it will also push the new policy rule so in this way you can really allow developers for them you know to go ahead and when they commit code also commit the security setting of it and when they're using GitOps, it automatically will apply. No one needs to go and make the fine tuning or the, the, the specific policy if you do want to make, you don't have to, but if you do want to make specific policy uh, for this deploy model. And this is something that, again, that can really provide um, uh, a very good way for you to automate the security and use your developers to pretty much define what required for them and you can use it uh, back in your deployment. So, if I want to summarize everything, um, hardening pod runtime configuration has now uh, a new and a friendlier model. So I really encourage you know everyone you know to go ahead and uh, and use it. Um, the pod security standards and the admission controller replace the PSP and the RBAC. So the model is much better, is more suitable for Kubernetes. It's much more friendlier and easier to use. It's highly customized. So you can both customize the standards to meet your needs. You can use not just the recommended or the, the, the set of um, uh, validating admission controller. Each of those options, whether using Kiverno or using o uh, Gatekeeper or you have your own, you can also have the ability to not just validate but also to mutate. And this mutate can really save you uh, a lot of time. And if you're using declarative policy engine and a built-in admission controller, you can really automate the entire model, as I showed, you know, using GitOps, and something that can really save you the burden, shift it left to developers, allow them to have a more uh, precise uh, definition. Thank you very much. If you have anything, feedback, comments, would love to hear from you. Uh, if you have any questions, we have some time for questions, I believe. Yes. Okay, so I'll just repeat the question. So the question was, if you're using, if you're using GitOps and using automatic the policy, the Git stop being the source of truth. And I think, I think not because in the Git, you have the policy, you have what you define or the state that you want to run. Now it's reflected in the cluster. Okay, so the only way is just like, you know, instead of, you know, having the burden of doing it afterwards, you can do it when you make the deployment. And still the policy, is in the gate with the code and you have this single source of truth. Now, if I understand you correctly, what you're saying is that that's correct, but in one gate I have part and in another gate repo I have a different part, right? But I think, again, you're correct that it may be distributed, but you don't lose the gate as your source of truth. You just have the relevant part there. What you can do is, you know, try to define to yourself, at least, or for the controller, what the degree controller you, is being used with any Git. So you can pretty much restrict it and have a, like a more you know, distributed uh, approach or at least adapt your deployment to that. But Basically separation of duties. Yes. But again, I think you, know, you still main, maintain your uh, no, concept of Git. Oh, okay, 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 understood. Okay, okay, understood. So you're saying what happened if the policy that I have is overrun by another policy which is the cluster and I gave the mutating webhook to
to the to the, to change and modify that. Okay, that's, that's a good point. I think this is maybe a case that you're right, and you can use just a validating webhook to avoid this scenario. I think the mutating webhook gives you some kind of flexibility because many of the mistakes I see are mistakes that are not done deliberately. I think because someone forgot or didn't know, or just use you know something that he found in a Helm chart re repo because he want to write by himself, and then. If you would know, you probably would do it. And in this case, imitating webhook can fix it. You're correct. If you want to keep the, the GitHub small, then you need to just use the validating webhook. But I think, again, it will save you a lot of time. So uh, what I mean is, I think this model should have like a feedback loop to, to do some sort of... To change back, yeah. Not to, oh, to change back, or at least to alert, or to find... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think it's a good uh, comment. Anyone else? So if not, thank you very much. And I think I saved you five minutes.